Hello, beautiful people. Happy, happy Hilaria, and welcome to Drawing Down the Stars. We're here with the Witches Symposium. I'm joined by my good friend Neil of Gnostic Informant, Dr. Ammon of Lady Babylon, Mandy Morehole. You love him, you know him, satirist extraordinaire. Check out his books. How's it going, everyone? Great. Happy Hilaria. It's the day of washing. Today is the day of the Addis Resurrection. That's amazing, wash, right? Wash your lettuce, wash your hands. Yep. Wash the stone of Magna Mater, too. That's what they would do today. Today would be the day. So yesterday, they buried the tree that Addis was represented from. They took the tree out of the temple. Yeah, the they, pine tree, right? Yeah, and they're all mourning. They're all mourning. And then yesterday, they... Oh, yes, no, yesterday was the day of rejoicing. The day before that, they were mourning and they buried the tree. Yesterday, they all rejoice and party, Bacchanalia style. Today, the day of washing, they take those. The stone has all the blood on it. You know why? I don't. Maybe I shouldn't say it because YouTube. But no, people, no, it's all good. We, we know why they they the initiates cut. You know they they and got initiated. This is serious. This is no joke. And they do it over the stone of Magna Mater. They give her the blood. Your my blood is your is is yours to the Great Mother. And uh, then they leave the blood there, and it stays on the stone until the next day. And the, the, then the the priests from the previous years come out and they wash the blood off. It's washing the blood. You know what I mean? So wild. They would cut their arms. They cut their arms um, kind of in tribute. It's like part of the dance. And um, we have this other scenes um, with Medea doing the same thing in the sacrifice. You slash your arms and you sp splatter the blood. I mean, we, not many of us do this, so you probably don't know what you know what the ex religious experience is like. But they cut their arms and flailed, splattering blood. Wow, on the tree as well. Wow, yeah, you know, I love it. That's Christi cool stuff. Christianity draws from this motif because they'll say you're washing the blood of the lamb. But we know that in Rome, they had the Torobolium. This is a big temple of Magda Mater, same goddess. And they would take the bowl in, and the blood would drip down from the to the bottom chamber, and the and whoever's down there being initiated would have washed in the blood. They would literally take a shower in the blood of a, of a bowl, and that's 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 the ritual of the great mother. We're talking ancient Bronze Age traditions that are being brought down to Rome. And it's like super, super ancient. We need to stress this because Julian tells us, right? What happens is that the Romans during the siege against the Carthaginians goes to the oracles at Delphi and the Delphian oracles tell them they need to go to Pergamon to retrieve Sibylle and they need to install the cult of Sibylle and, uh, on um, what's the, what's the, the hill? Palatine, and then, Palatine. Palatine Hill. And then they, they, they have that whole story where they bring her and then she can't get up the river and then the priestess comes out and it's like magic. She can lift this massive um, black stone, which was said to be a meteorite. Now, let me say it up the that. hill. <laughs> we got to put, we got to go back a couple of years. Rome is in trouble at this time. They're being destroyed by Hannibal. Hannibal has Rome surrounded by all of his legions. They're done for. Hannibal is unstoppable. He's defeated the Celts, the Iberians. He's all over Italy. He's conquered all of Italy, except he's a, he's, he's, he wants to sur surround Rome and basically like make them like plead. Okay, fine. Take us over. But the priests go and consult. Whenever this happens, they're, they're said, consult the Sybil. Read what the Sybil says. They consult the Sybil. The Sybil says, go and get the Magna Mater. They do it. So this is, I'm just saying, this is, these are the facts. You could, whatever you want to believe about this is whatever you want to believe. This is the facts. They get this, they get the statue. They bring it to Rome. The very next year, Hannibal's defeated. But not only that, within the next 50 years, Rome goes from a little city state to having the whole Mediterranean world under their thumb. The Seleucids are defeated. The Ptolemies are, are paying tribute. The Macedonians are a puppet state. The Aetolian League is like, all right, fine, Rome, rule us. Rome conquers the entire Mediterranean within 50 years of taking this Kybele stone. And this is the last thing I want to say. I don't let you guys talk because I always do, I always take over these shows. I got to stop doing this. But <laughs> there's a text from Jeremiah where 
uh, the people are speaking to Jeremiah and they're like, Jeremiah, we used to worship the great mother. It sa literally says great mother or, or says the queen of heaven. And when we worship the queen of heaven, we had bread to eat. We had wine to drink. And then you took it away from us. And now under Yahweh, we can't stop getting conquered. The reason why I bring that up is because it's funny how you look at the evidence. People keep saying, people want always, people always want to say that, oh, Christianity conquered the world. Look how, how successful it was. Everyone's a Christian or Muslim today because of Judeo-Christianity. But the evidence actually suggests the opposite. We see prosperous nations under worshiping the goddess. You know, Lady Babylon, in is, who is Ishtar, conquering the underworld. This is like the motif that everyone knew. But Rome is conquering the whole Mediterranean under Sibylle. And then they, when they when then when they switch to Christianity, you get the Black Plague and Dark Ages for for a thousand years, and Rome falls to the Byzantine or to the Ottomans. It's well, the there's, opposite. <laughs> there's another part to that hymn to the Mother of All Gods that we're we're leaving out, which is the which is the beginning where he talks about the fall of Greece. Why does Julian say that the the emperor? Are the empire of Alexander fell. He says that fell because they persecuted the women and the Maenads, specifically the followers of the great mother of the great mother, right? And he saw in his own time the Christians doing the same, and he was prophesizing if they destroy the mother cult, the empire will fall. <laughs> right? They just took it, they took everything out of balance. There was a balance that that was that was there. And once they take, once you remove part of that balance, things just go up chaos quickly. You get black plagues, you get constant war, constant every two years there's a new emperor because he gets killed by the by his gut by his own guards. They can't even keep an emperor for more than sometimes it'd be two months, new emperor, two months, new emperor. Christ, like the, the Byzantine Christians, that was th there's people who who do who read who um compare. The, the military logistics, comparing the Byzantines to the Romans under the Republic era, where they had, you know, the logistics of Caesar and Pompey and Sola and Marius. And they're like, do they? Th and this goes to, to Mandy, you like to talk about how progress, linear progress is a myth. Because this actually proves that. Because it's like, wait, they went backward. They lost technology and, 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 and the knowledge of warfare and, and uh, logistics, somehow they lost all that stuff. They went backwards in time, it seems like. Yeah, the illusion of progress is a poison. Um, you know, you can convince yourself of all sorts of things. And then, you know, the science and history and all that doesn't actually turn out in your favor. You know, uh, lots of people, your, cultures are very good at convincing themselves that they're superior, you know, and it's, it's never true. It's never been true. And it's never going to be true. It's impossible to be to, to ever for that to ever be true. So you know, there's there's it hasn't there ever been progress. There's just been temporary improvement right. over time. Like okay, cute. That's been happening since all of eternity. All of eternity. We just so happen to be human beings that are witnessing it and writing it down. You know, it's like it's not. There's nothing special about it. We're just human beings using language, which is possibly the worst possible way to communicate any of any truth. You know. Definitely. Yeah. Progress that's is one a, of the, that's it, a, a good point, right? Like all of the history books tell us, right, that we're built on the the ruins of ancient civilizations, but then we don't find anything that's there. <laughs> you know, so what's going on, right? What is it? What I mean is like we have such a small, limited grasp of what actually happened in the in the ancient past, right? After after once you get past the Bronze Age, it's kind of a big like who the heck knows what people were up to? But there's also a reality that we need to understand here is that people have always been as intelligent as we are now. Right. Right. As capable. They just didn't have the material science, you know? So well, and they use their, the they use their a lot of these ancient peoples, right? And they use their intelligence in other areas. That, right. Like if you took you or me, or let's say myself, you drop me off in the year 10,000 B.C. I'm I'm gone. I'm dead and within a day. I'm not going to survive. Yeah. I would yeah. not know what to do. I'm so, I'm so dependent on my phone and DoorDash and calling Uber. I don't. There's not. What am I going to do? I'm done for. But the people living in that time period are survive. They know they know exactly what to do to survive. They know exactly how to start a fire. They know exactly how to hunt their food. They know exactly how to plant stuff. They know we wouldn't know what to do. We would be so obsolete to them 
And that's what I'm saying. Th you're right. Their brain power is still the same. They're still humans. But like, what was so wild to me, though, about your video, Neil, and I want to get Ammon in on this, is that what we see from the very ancient, ancient text is this, this right of this savior goddess who with, goes down to the underworld to resurrect her lover, right? You know, with 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 that issue, it's so reminiscent of of what Ammon talks about with with Medea, and you see it also. There's so many parallels to like, like you brought up how many different cultural groups in this in this documentary. There was I went all across the map in every era. I I tried to somebody wrote a comment, and I like the comment a lot. They're like, "I love your videos because you 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 find sources from all all um what do they say." From every wind blow, from every direction that the wind blows, and then you and they tie them together. And I was like, yeah, that's kind of what I do. But this idea of these lovers that are entwined that die for each other—either it's a mother and a, and her daughter, or it's a and it's or it's a pair of lovers, right? Yeah. Whether it's Gilgamesh and his partner, or it's Ishtar and Damuzi, or Isis, Isis right? and Nephthys, two women that go to the tomb of Osiris, just like in Mark, two women well, go. You to blew my mind when they said that Osiris is Dionysus. Like, what do you make of all this, Ammon? How does this connect to Medea in your thought, in your research? And you have the Jason. He's the healer. He's the savior. Go ahead. You're, you're muted. You're muted, Amon. Yeah, sorry. I, I knew that, but we were having problems reaching the button. Yeah. Um, first, I want to say um, ancient Greek is superior. And as a linguist, I can tell you for a fact, languages are not the same. They're not all born equal. That's true. It is superior to the point that they were able to produce literature that I can tell you half the time I spend with these authors in their own tongue, ha a full half the time, I couldn't sit with them over lunch. These people are freaking geniuses, fucking geniuses, right? And I'm serious. I can even read philosophers I hate. I hate and I know, God, the bless them. The reasoning that's being used is phenomenal, phenomenal. So, I mean, even to sit, listen to Galen talk about treating patients, I've, um, I would, I feel no different than talking to a modern physician. Um, so let's not forget that's there and that these people, to me, that's what's so remarkable about the great mother. Um, look, she's being worshipped in Rome where they regulate everything in the religion. Everything. There's a state regulation. If you didn't realize that, you don't understand the secret of Rome's success. When they imported, because like Neil was saying, um, he was down south, Hannibal. He was still, they were still at war. And, you know, what, what are we going to do? importing her brought an entirely entirely alien form of worship to rome and that was the beautiful magic um of this whole process that girl that was in the river they brought that stone and the girl is in the river and she's she is sexy 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 this girl is and she's got a reputation and people are saying she shouldn't be there because she's not a virgin she takes off her top and grabs the thing and pulls it up the river gives them the bird <laughs> right right it this is the thing is full of omens incredible omens that this catapulted roman power forward neil is completely right um do you see this perfect seamlessness of the roman religion composed of many many different types right many different religions working together imports the mother the great mother yeah and off rome goes you must keep focus on the great mother things happen when you do and when you cut her out of society you get christianity 
fantastic. And we all go into the ground. I like the idea that progression is a myth because I can tell you a group of people that did it way better. I can tell you a group, they're the ones who invented libraries. The biggest discovery that we're sitting on right now is the Herculaneum Library. You want to know how much great mother you're going to get from that Julian? That's from the, you realize that from the Gins, Julia. From the Julian Gins. This is going to have those lost books that we were all, we all thought had been burned by that jerk Stilico. Yeah. It's fantastic. So I that's like where I, that's where I am. And yeah, what, which one is it's the bathing today. We're at the bath, right? But remember who invented the bath, who invented the bath, according to Diodorus um, Medea. Oh, he was it? Oh, was this Diodor say Medea did? Yeah. <laughs> he says she invented baptism. And then, and then there's a fragment, there's a lost fragment that's only preserved in Diogenes Laertius. He says that Diogenes just happens to be the same name as him, five centuries, six centuries apart. Uh, he says Diogenes, um, the cynic, wrote a play dedicated to Medea. That's all he wrote. He didn't write anything down, but he wrote a play. He just decided to be, I'm going to be a playwright for now. Just did, wrote one play called Medea. We have no idea what it was about. We lost it. But there is a, a clue. There's a quote from Diogenes where he says that Medea shouldn't be depicted as this evil witch because she gave man the power to heal their bodies and preserve themselves and heal. And the rights of her, it's like he said something along those lines. You could find it in Diogenes, it's in there. And I'm just thinking, dude, I love this guy, Diogenes, because he's right. And but you can, Jason is named Jason, and his name is that he's the hero, right? And he, you could see in that story the that Medea is representing Lady Babylon, which Ishtar is called Lady Babylon, but you could see how Medea is the savior in that story. Jason's in trouble. He's on, and Medea comes and saves him. So you can see there's that there's that layer in that story too in the Argonautica. It's clear when you read the Argonautica version of it, right? Like the Ammon sent me uh, the Philarius Vlacus version, and it's like Medea, there's all of this language where they equate her eyes, right? They're using the same religious language as the Muse. The entire idea is Medea's the Muse. Jason has invoked the Muse. And the muse will give him what he wants if he follows her. What's the problem? She gets too angry and vicious for him, rips apart her brother, just goes after the king. Jason has second thoughts, says, I want out. There's no out. You drew, you drew down the muse, motherfucker. You got to you, you gotta deal with this now. <laughs> I would pay all my money right now just to, to be able to watch the play that, that Diogenes the Cynic put together in Athens. Can you imagine what, it, who knows what it was? Like, it was a different rendering of the story of Medea. Yeah. Lost yeah. And in the, in the fragments of Sophocles, um, we know there was a trilogy. Again, um, one of them was called the Root Cutters, but it revolved around her. So, um, her and, uh, uh, have you seen where she's also, they say she's the one who came up with the fumigations. If you stop and think about that for a second, I'm not talking about, you know, burning a little incense in front of an altar. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about filling a space with a gas, right? That Plan everybody, it. everybody breathes. Plan think it. about that for a minute. Just medically think about that for a minute. The genius there is incredible. They're absolutely incredible. And um, one of the things that I, I never mentioned this, but there's an oracle of Trophonius in Boeotia. It's a Boeotian oracle of Trophonius, and it's right up the against the mountain. So there's a cliff. There's a, excuse me, a, 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 yeah, a high cliff face behind it. And um, anyway, um, the city that was there to support the oracle where the oracle was, um, it was originally called Midea. Um, and 
um, it's using the same Greek root, and it's an oracle that's been planted. It's one of those that you drop the person, they drop them way down in this chamber full of snakes, right after you, they've drugged you, and you end up trying to wander your way out. And if you can, if you don't die, then you tell the priest, um, what, it, what were the instructions they gave you? You know what I mean? It's like sending someone in transit. The incubation. The incubation. Come, come back. <laughs> And by the way, we didn't, we didn't even mention the name, the medicine, the word medicine comes from Medea. There's no wonder why. This is all make, once you realize that, the symbol of the serpent on the rod, half my video was pointing to that. I kept reminding you about the serpent on the rod in my video because it's medicine. Uh, the universe, right now, the World Health Organization has the same snake on the rod right now in 2024. And that's the, a symbol that is so is it, old. There's a clear thing, though, happening here that's kind of radical that you see with Asclepius in these later kind of cults, right? Is a masculinization, a paternalization, a stealing of the women's mystery, right? And an erasing of the of women from that side of, of the whole thing. Now, I want to bring up this because there's a huge implications in your video that connects both Ammon's work and Mandy's work. And it's basically what I'm getting off of all your research that you were doing, that the Bible seems like orchestrated colonial satire designed Absolutely. to weaponize the religious ideas of the people into creating some kind of imperial cult that would, you know, enslave everyone. Basically. Yeah. Uh, they, these Alexandrians recognized that there was this, this story of the, of the Catabasis and the Anabasis that it, whatever, whatever there was there, whatever the physics was behind this story, that it was getting people hooked. And they knew this is, we need to capture the essence of these mystery religions into a, what. One key thing in, in Greek philosophy that I got when I was studying philosophy in university, one of the, the, what, what a professor in India told me, he said, this is the key argument. And it's basically Heraclitus says that everything is flux. If everything is change, where's truth? Where is structure? Where is form? So what does Plato do in response to this? Where, what happens is that Plato invents the noble lie. You have right. to make shit up. You have to lie to people because the vast majority of people cannot deal with the fact wow. of the uncertainty and absurdity of their reality, the limitations of mind. And the fact that we can't fully know that everything is in this state of flux. And this is where this Christianity comes out of this fear. These angry old intellectual men who knew how to manipulate people through story. They saw right. what was happening culturally and they stole it. And they basically made it about moralizing. Told them, stop doing gay shit. You know, stop doing all this stuff. So, you know, listen to Plato. He's like the worst moralizer of all time. Like, read really no language, but my read, God. If you read Plato's laws, just want all that one text, Plato's laws, nomos, you'll see where Judeo-Christianity comes from. It's right there. It's all yeah. right there. You and by the way, early Plato is amazing. The you early, brought up, though, there's Plato's all, you are talking about more. this. We were talking about this before the stream. All across the Mediterranean are these platonically influenced monastic orders that are also somewhat influenced by Asclepius. All of these, like whether the Essenes or whatever, there's there's all kinds of them. The gymnosophists. There's, so They're performing the the incubation rituals. This this was some sort of there the katabasis that you get in the, in the mythology was a reality. People who. Yeah. Were, Especially people who were sick, they would be sent to the priest, and not only are you going to be healed, but they're going to do some research on you. You're going to go in this cave. You're going to take this venom or whatever it was, some concoction of root cutters and roots and venoms and whatever the hell with the hell that I don't. Who knows? I'm sure it's in Galen somewhere. But they they took this medicine. They put them in a coma sometimes for weeks. They would say, and um. The archaeology in, in southern Italy, they call the, they call the, the doctors ulis, and that's that was that's a term that means it's like an Apo Apollo, right? Very, very similar to the word Ap Apollyon. I mean, it can mean destroy or heal, which is like kind of what medicine is. A little dose of venom can heal you. A lot of venom can kill you. It's the it's the concept of medicine, right? So they go into these caves. They take this medicine. They go into a state of complete death, basically. 
And then they would come out of it and they would tell the priests what happened in their dreams and they would record it and they would compare it. And there was like, who knows? I'm, I'm not like, I'm still digging into some, a lot of the stuff we've lost, but what I've just told you, we we know about like that's established. Yeah, those incubations are big, a big part of uh, that Greek heritage. And it's like the priests who are recording all that kind of stuff that you realize they have a ton, they have an exposure to a area of psychology and religion that you really don't otherwise have. So they're keeping a bank of information and they know how to interpret dreams. People are like, you know, what does that mean? Right. And or you think maybe a psychoanalyst. No, 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 they're light years beyond that. Right. And they run this constantly, this machine. Mysteries were machines that just ran. And you can pull out all of this evidence from that. And the goddess, by the way, people mentioned, I want to make sure that we know what did they call her? Um, what did they call this great mother that they imported? from the Phrygian East. What do they call her? They called her the, uh, the Soter, the savior, right? You got to realize, you got to realize 200 years before Jesus is ever, is ever in the spotlight as savior. Um, we have the kind of paradigmatic savior, the, the great mother. Right. So that is very much, I love the fact that you guys brought the medicine in. That's very much a, an aspect of the medical side. And um, that's what we're getting. Of course, Jesus was the great physician because that model had been passed down to us, right? And people don't realize that's Eastern as it can be. You got to realize the Romans really went out on a limb, right? They listened to the oracle and they did exactly, exactly what she said to do, bring back the Idaean mother, Right, we see how, we see how totally crazy revived her worship. Bronze. You see how crazy shit gets once you get Emperor Elagabalus, right? Yeah, you know, and he tries to even bring the cult even further, and he wants to go through that whole divine imitation and and become Sibylle incarnate. There's all this crazy esotericism there, I and then know. all the slander, right? The Romans almost want to reject him, right? Yeah, but they kept his religious order intact. He, they never so even though the stories about him are like oh he sucked blah 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 you if you look at the evidence the religious system that he imp, imp, implemented stays intact all the way till Aurelian and then he institutes that that Sol Invictus holiday feast but he it says in the sources the last Akitu festival on record was in um, Palmyra in Roman occupied Palmyra where Elagabalus instituted the Akitu festival. This is the same, this is the same festival I was talking about with Ishtar, but in Rome, you start getting Sol Invictus Mithras. You start getting this Roman religion of Sol Invictus coming out of that stuff. It's all from the Severan dynasty. So, uh, and, I think and remember Mithras, I'm sorry, Mandy, he, remember Mithras comes from the stone, right? He's petrogenic, right? Um, who else? What stone are we talking about? The great mother, you moron. Don't yeah. you? Oh, <laughs> speaking of Herculaneum, and man, now let you talk next time. Like, right? Speaking of, speak, let, last thing I want to I got to get this off. Speaking of Herculaneum, they found in 2007, a statue of Addis sitting on a throne with a pomegranate in one hand. He's got a wreath on his head with berries on it. And um, he's got his Phrygian cap. It's that, that. So I cannot wait to find what these texts say there. Because if you got Addis sitting on a throne and there's all these texts sitting right there, oh, man, we're going to find some good shit. But go ahead, Mandy. Oh, well, I said I was going to say um, I think we should recognize – one of uh, Elagopoulos's major contributions to uh, human existence. And it shows how much, you know, how different things are, the more they change, they stay the same or however that saying goes is um, Elagopoulos invented the whoopee cushion to prank people at festivals. I heard about that. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And we're still using that still to this day. So, you know, uh, 
you'd have one That's brilliant really, idea. And you of course, he would know that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, Herodian says Elagabalus would dance, and people would get hypnotized by his dancing. Like that's the stories about Elagabalus are just amazing. And doesn't that also sound like Salome? Like there's all of this integration. Like when you when you here's the thing when you when you read the Bible without looking for the mother goddess cult, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But then if you start filling her in, all of a sudden you start to get a fleshed out story, and it starts to make sense. It's like it is. Um, there was a YouTuber I saw, or, or TikToker, he's kind of a comedian, and he's like a, he's Ragnar Johnson, and he said that, he said it so great, he said, the Bible is pro-Zeus propaganda. That's what it is. It's like, Zeus, imagine if Zeus Joe. was like a petulant child, right, and then and wanted to erase everyone else and assert that he was the only power. Not like um, any other deity who sat on the throne did that before, <laughs> Kronos. But, you know, uh, <laughs> point is, is that if you read it through that lens of it's this- a great point. Of, of, of euhemerization and trying to reduce everything down to a single cultural kind of idea as a national story of imperialism, both the Old Testament and the New Testament make perfect sense. Yeah, because right. there's no requirement to, to, to be dedicated to yourself to Zeus in the old religion. There's no there's no there's no requirement of only Zeus you have to pray. No, it's you have your like Zeus is just the sky father. He's a dick. I mean, we know who Zeus is, but like you don't have, there's no there's no requirement to just give yourself over to Zeus and bow to him all day. That's that's Judeo Christian crap. You oh. notice that there isn't a <laughs> Zeus mystery, even though everyone's praying to Zeus, but there is no Zeus mystery, right? Unless he, I guess he kind of appears as Eubulius, some scholars say, in yeah. the Eleusinian mysteries. And you know, Dionysus is his kid. He's there, but you know, he's not the direct of any of the major stories. Like he's not the one who intercedes. He's usually the one who wants to mess with man, split us in two. He's always, a, you know, stop Prometheus. All this kind no, of stuff. Nonus tells you the real king of heaven is the heir, Bacchus, D D Dionysus. He, is the, he was chosen by the, by the fates to, to take over the reins from Zeus. And then Hera, you know, did what she did. But all we need to know is that. That's all you need to know. You need to know that Dionysus is all you need. Just go to honor, was, honor Bacchus. It was fated, right? Everybody knows it's been fated for Zeus to be overthrown. We live with that in our culture, right? It's been fated. Zeus will fall. Um, now, uh, half of what drives mythology is the attempt to not fall, right? And the other half is the in the impending and faded reality that, yes, indeed, um, Yahoo will fall, right? Um, yeah, love it. I think that's why he's so grumpy all the time. You know, Jove or Jehovah, I think that's why he's grumpy all the time. And not only that, he's never held anything. He always, his land is always conquered all the time. Yeah. There's never a war that the side of Yahoo won, ever, not once. <laughs> But this is this is this is something that I I think is one of the the greatest crimes of of the Abrahamic religions, um, is the and not all of them, but they led to this idea of this absolute black and white kind of ideology. I guess you could also say Zoroastrianism to an extent, but like they reduce these God is absolutely good, this is absolutely bad. There's no nuance like. In the Greek myths, you see these deities go through transformations, right? They don't exist as a single thing. They're like people, right? Zeus, at the beginning of the story, is the hero, right? He he saves us from the tyrant Kronos. He frees his siblings. He ushers in a golden age, a new, a, a, no, a silver age or whatever. Yeah. But then he wields the power too long and you need him. You need reason. To come in and turn him into Athena, right? <laughs> well, I know about that. You see the the balance shift. So you first you have Aranos, he's the sky father. His name literally means heaven or sky. And then he's succeeded by Kronos, agriculturer, Chthonian. He's very much like a like an like a, a, a older version of Bacchus in a lot of ways. They they look like the same thing. And then he's succeeded by Zeus, another sky father. 
another basically another Aranos, and then Ar and then Zeus Bacchus. They go back and forth, back and forth. This is shit. Yeah, shit, shit the child to come, right? That version of Dionysus it's with like, the horns that's it's coming. Like, Left, right, left, right, left, right. It's, yeah, it's, that's the, it's the cycle, the poles, right? They tell us which end of the pole reigns in heaven and one end will be dragged through the dirt. And if you notice the story, it's always the mother who instigates, right? In the beginning, who's the one who overthrows Uranus, right? Instigates it. It's, it's Gaia, Gaia. Never, Gaia never, Gaia is always there though. All throughout yeah. Uranus and Gaia, Saturn and Gaia, Zeus and you know, Zeus and, and, and Gaia. It's always, Gaia is always there. Gaia never gets well, overthrown. You see, with, with all of the mother god, like with all of these energies, you see a constant evolution and refinement. Like, we, Macrobius talks about this, and he pointed that out to me, where, you know, Saturn is Dionysus. Dionysus is like yep. a refined, evolved version. And then Yacus is a refined, evolved version of Dionysus, right? It's right. like a cycle going down and going down, going down. But this is true for the great mother too, right? She starts off as that chaos cosmic womb. And then, you know, Gaia, and then Rhea, and then Hera, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're all Earth and, and Demeter. They, they, right? And Demeter. Right? Day is, a, is like, I think it's an ionic version of the word gay. Mer they both mean Earth. So Day Mater means Earth Mother. Just like Gaia, like it's it's another name, it's another way to say Earth Mother. So even yeah, every, everybody knows, everybody knows the Great Mother is the original Oracle. If you want to set up a Telesterian like the followers of Yahoo did in the wilderness, if you want to have that Oracle, you have to start with Gaia, yeah, uh, or Ga or Da as they called her, as in Da Mater, the Great Earth Mother. Right, and people are shocked. They're like, "What? That's what Demeter means?" Yes, of course. These are the oracular mystery that begins with that great Earth Mother. I love and, that. And notice that how they, have to, they have to set up a serpent on a rod. That's the ultimate symbol, according to their own book, of evil. The snake in the in the garden. They're using that as their oracular device. Isn't it tells you something right there? The, the only way to get to the Oracle, they have to go through this dark symbol that even they know is in their in their eyes, not to us, but to them, they have to go through this like symbol of the of the serpent of Satan, basically. You know what I mean? It, did you so know? Did you know, about. Neil, in the in the Septuagint, it doesn't say rod. I was shocked when I read that passage because that's what I was expecting. It says tattoo. Really? It's a, yeah, it's a mark. And when you um, when you are exposed to the venom, you look at the mark and remember, right? <laughs> remember that you've been made. You've been you've been made completely whole. All you have to do is look at the mark. Um, you become immune. How do you become immune to these? Sir? Oh God, are you kidding? Did you see everything in the Phrygian East, what they were doing with those serpents? And all the Bacchants are waving. You know what Bacchant women wave? Serpents. They serpents. have pictures of this on vases. They're running out of the woods holding up serpents. And you're like, oh, shit, run. Those things are poisonous. You know what I mean? They all have arrows and everything. Right? Oh, God. Or I want to go Earth Mother hunting. The... Um, the Earth Mother, who is the oracular Diwanasa. That's an old Mycenaean title for the head queen oracular huntress. That's Is that the sexiest thing you've ever seen in your life? Don't worry, she's a virgin. She's a virgin, right? Um, and she's going to hunt you. Ooh, the earthiness. They have a, depictions of this in the literature of these are the women who grab the dirt. You know what you do when you're giving birth? You grab the dirt and you sing. Oh, my God. Who oversees the, this process? Diana does, the Diwanasa, right? Oh, my God. That, that's amazing. That puts, I'm sorry, but that kind of stuff puts Jesus to shame. Give me yeah. one, one, one sexy huntress. You know what I mean? Oh, God, sexy virgin huntress who, by the way, what does her priestess do? Her priestess sacrifices. What does she sacrifice? Humans. 
<laughs> wow, that takes guts, man. That takes guts. I love that. Uh, Medea was trying to move them towards uh, pushing that in a healing direction, you know, letting the people go. Well, you do get Artemis at Ephesus, which is interesting, where she becomes the, the queen mother of the bees, right? And she has all those bee eggs on her, and her priests are called the worker bees. What and are then those? Yeah, Go what ahead, are sir. those things that hang from her? Okay, your vote is B eggs. Yeah, so when I was talking to Dr. Carla, she's doing I don't know if you've met Dr. Carla, but Neil introduced me to I her. Have. Amazing, amazing scholar. And she's writing a book on this and I, over all of the sources that she's found that's the most consistent and the oldest one, and she says that they're never once ever referred to as breasts and that the oldest statue they were black. Right, so the skin would have been black, so they're but the eggs or whatever are white. So she says they're almost she believes they're almost certainly bees because of all the beekeeping. The worker bees are the names of the priests, and there are evidence of beekeeping all around Ephesus that are still there. So that, I think that, yeah. I'm glad you go to that side of the of the fence. Um, because they have Zeus who's also wearing this thing that looks like uh you know, okay, a bunch of bunch of bee eggs, um, yeah, bunch of breasts. I mean, that's the other way that people have gone. Yeah, um, breasts. You know, what is that? Yeah, um, if he's got it, you know, he's got the. By the way, I wanted to say, if we're going she to he, remember we're still with the great mother, right? And if we're going he to she let's go that direction he to she we know how to get there right we know how to get from he to she um catullus uh gave, gave us a beautiful snappy i'm sure you've read this already um 63 catullus 63 yeah. catullus, catullus is a roman poet he's one of the neoterics and he's from the first century he only he he's, dies in a very short period of time he was a young guy when he died but lots of imitators though <laughs> Yeah, right. He's got a he's got a beautiful, beautiful um, work where he starts describing him, and then halfway through, right after he castrates himself, she becomes herself and starts talking as she. He doesn't skip a beat. It's understood the transition, and this will blow you off your feet. The thing that we have such a hard time with. Such a hillbillyish time with um, that whole transition between sexes. They had no problem. They switched right away. Their pronouns weren't a weren't an issue. What are you talking, you know, about? talking and, about? Some of these ancient rites with Ishtar and Sumerian and whatnot. And yeah, really Ali, Ali are yeah. the ones that go down and save her while she's a corpse, and they right? sprinkle. And there's two. You, know, you get a Eucharist. You get they sprinkle the bread the bread of life on her and the water of life on her, and it revives her, and she comes up, and springtime comes. But do you notice that there's two galley, yes. right? Just like Addis and Aegisthus. There are always so two. two. There are always two. two. But it's it's either two galley or two women, because in in, the, yeah. in Mark, there's two women that come to him, right? They're, they're, right. Copying, they're copying the prototype. But with, with Osiris, when Osiris is in pieces, because the set just cut him into different pieces, guess who comes and revives his body? Isis and Nephthys, two women. So you have the gal. It's either two golly or two women, and all across the board, it always happens. Yeah, it's so wild. And it's, okay, so I was reading this one text, right, where they were basically saying that the pr gender was such a a non issue in ancient summer. You had priests who would transition sexes and work as opposite sex. Okay, so you had. Uh, men who would become women and then operate as temple priestesses. And you had women who would become men and operate as temple guards. And they, you had some who would go through rites where they would, this was a permanent, either they would remove their breasts or remove their testes. But then you had people who did it part time just for festivals where right. they would just show up and they would dress up. You know, like it was like a it was like a big cultural thing. They would do it as part of these rites to the goddess, you know, or, or to the muzi. The women would transition to be like a man, and the the men would transition to be like a woman. It was just a cultural thing. It says it says in the text that uh, about about the uh, hilaria. It says if you were a, a, a passerby or a watcher, 
and you were just sitting there watching the rights, you had an obligation to throw to give the person who just initiated themselves new new clothing. So it was like a thing. Like you were a part of the mysteries. You had to do something. Don't just stand there. At least bring them clothing. At least do that. So they would do that. That was part of the thing. So I had a uh, observation recently uh, having to do with the gender transition, and it has to do with uh, transition from as being one gender on the in, in on Earth to transitioning to a different gender in the underworld. And I thought it was a fascinating fascinating observation, and I got it from Carl Ruck. He says that Hecate, when she is in her three-headed form, she is actually Cerberus. So, you know, Hecate's, you know, this, the goddess of those liminal spaces, that dream state, right? That that the space there. But when she when she's in her three-headed form, she is Cerberus. And it's, I, I, and I, I'm, I would, I, it blew my mind when I read that because it can made it, it connected a lot of the dots with my. Uh, study and all of that stuff in my there's opinion. a lot of esotericism that i've read and i wanted to ask ammon about this in regards to this idea of saturn and um a lot of this comes from the alchemical tradition where they talk about how when chronos is defeated that he's castrated not not only like just like uranos was but that he's feminized so that when he goes to the underworld he becomes a, a female energy and that saturn currently because they're now, you know, they're they're not on the throne. It's Zeus on the throne. They're operating as this divine feminine, as that Rhea energy. Absolutely. Yeah, you know what I'll say to that? We can take Zeus and we can take away his erection completely. And who are we? We're the we are the dragons. We are the children of Ahis. What did Priapus do to Zeus? Then? Echidna. Right, and this brings in Cerberus as well because everybody knows that Cerberus, the guardian, um, has the black spume in his mouth. We know what that does and where that comes from. That comes from the Typhonian. And we, as the children of Echidna, have taken away Zeus's erection. Did you know that? We got the Neura. We stole the Neura from him. Right. I mean, it's amazing. You talk about emasculation or the removal of the genitalia. Um, they're doing it to Zeus, too. This is prominent. This is so prominent. You would think just from the religion, these people castrated everyone. You think everybody ended up kind of Circe's castrating people. Didn't nobody know that, notice that? Right. That Odysseus is running around. Um, from island to island being held captive by different women and they're threatening to castrate him right and you know works out a deal to have sex with him like a eunuch like any good drug eunuch can do would you like to drug and uh, force a um, beautiful person to become your sex slave if you do um the bronze age is your time, baby. Um, if you're a woman, if you're a woman, sorry, sorry, men don't do this. Isn't that odd? By men the way, don't, men don't do this. They just end up trafficking, right? They don't, they don't end up in that position of the potnia theta, right? We're talking about the great mother sitting between two lions. You know who, you know who that is. My God. Okay, I'll stop. No, you're good. I want to show you guys. This is from. Pompeii, I don't know if it's Herculean, but it's probably right or near there. Who do you think that is right there? That's Priapus. He's 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 the brother of Eros. Okay. He's the child of Aphrodite. His brother is Eros. He's the son of Dionysus. It's the holiest thing you can think of. Look at him. He's got his giant erection out. The reason why I brought him up, he's he's the end of the genealogy from, from Thanes. All the way through Dionysus to his son that he has with holy Aphrodite, the queen of heaven that we were talking about, and his son is Priapus. Now, Dr. Amo, isn't there a story about Priapus and Zeus that we forgot to mention? Oh, God, what is it, Neil? Tell us. Doesn't Zeus choke on this? I'm not kidding when I say that. I think there's a source. I could be wrong. There's a source that Zeus swallows Priapus 
Oh, yeah, everybody knows that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good old Orphic. It's in uh, Ian West's Orphic Fragments um, mm. or Orphic Cosmogonies. Um, yeah, no, he's got it in there. Everybody knows that um, Zeus goes down on Fanny's and lumps lumps his lusciousness. I don't know what you call it. In Greek, they said he swallows his idoion. He swallows his man part. Um, isn't that cool? Zeus is swallowing a lot of stuff. He swallows a whole, a whole um, um, goddess and or order to produce right? Athena. Yeah. <laughs> Priapus, is, Priapus is the, that's the, um, that's the savior. What, what do they do? That's he's like a charm that you put on your in your garden, and it's, it wards off all evil spirits. So the fact that Zeus can't even he, he he's bowing down to Priapus. That's what that text tells me, right? Yeah, um, that little talisman that we use. It's a penis with wings on it. Yeah. I mean, isn't that a cool symbol? I would love to see somebody wearing that as a necklace. I saw a whole room. I went to the Met Museum in New York. There's a whole room full of those. Little, little little ancient Greek dildos. I loved it. I was like, I, was like, I had my phone out. I'm videoing the whole thing. Yeah, you give those to your children to wear because they ward off. They or you can put them on the front of a house, and it wards off the evil eye. You know, it's a form of magic. Because when you shake a dildo on somebody's face, and I proved this, I'm very proud to say at St. Mary's University, where we gave dildos to all of the. Um, chorus of Furies, and they pointed those dildos in the face of those priests that were wrapped up in those um, molestation and rape and all sorts of stuff. Um, they're dealing with courts and stuff. Anyway, uh, it's powerful. You take somebody off their, you take somebody off their footing when you do that. And there's a magic. They're all they're doing is saying, "Look, this is a kind of magic." And what do we call it? We Romans. Finally, the Romans thought up something unique, and they said, oh, this is the fascinum. Um, Yeah, we're going to fascinate you. We're going to, to point this at you and put you under our spell, and that's how it is. We did that at a university, and the effect was marvelous. Their, um, their hits on the, their porn hits on their server went through the roof. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm serious. I wouldn't lie to you. That's so wild. Holy shit. <laughs> but like, there's so much going on though too, right? With this, we have to remember, right? That in the Orphic uh, cosmogonies, right? In the Lithica, Eros takes on this entire, Eros and Eris, right? This idea, this combination of desire and strife. These are the defining things of the universe, right? Oh. Heraclitus <laughs> tells us that strife is what leads to, to movement it is what causes the flow there is no flow with people strength. didn't realize people didn't realize till post enlightenment that when you read hesiod's theogony it's not just a fairy tale there's a scientific layer behind all of the gods that are being born and right in the beginning from chaos eros and nix dark matter and gravity think about it because Eros is desire, attraction, gravity. Nyx is Black Knight, and that's dark matter. That's if you're gonna say now, think about it. There's if there if these are two dueling opposites, and Eros is gravity and the desire. What's the opposite of that? Dark matter, and it just happens to be that genius Hesiod called her Nyx. What? Well, even though that's just a coincidence, it's a mind blowing coincidence that he thought of that, right? It's yeah, it's it is it is. It's it, how did he know about that? How did he know about dark matter and gravity in seven eight hundred BC? Well, it gets even more wild when you start to read into the mathematics and you start to look for the codes. How are they knowing the mathematical function of the entire universe? They're mapping, they know everything. Like they're mapping where the stars are, where, where the planets are, the size of the universe, the shape of the universe. Yeah. Plato tells us it's a hexagon. You know, he gives yeah, you a mathematical Plato says, formula Adam, for it. Plato said atoms are dumb. There's no way that um, Democritus is right. And all the early Christian writers are like, yeah, Plato, get him. The atomists are dumb. They don't know anything. Turns out 
once again, another post enlightenment realization <laughs> that the atomists were correct the whole time. The Platonists were kind of wrong about their idea of forms. The problem with when we're looking at the ancient science, especially when you're dealing with mathematics and magic, right? And medicine. And Ammon can attest for this, especially on the medicine side, is that it's all written in, in code. And half of the time, they're not even writing stuff down because it's hidden. This is within upper echelons. This is the most valuable weaponry and power that people had, right? Medea's magic that grants immortality also becomes Greek fire, right? These are, they're synonymous, right? And if, if, if your enemy got Greek fire, all of a sudden, you're toast. Right, so we have to remember so much of this mathematics, so much of the science was hidden within these coded rights. And then when when the tides changed, it got lost because the people who knew the rights got killed. You know, it's not that the women didn't know how to write; they didn't write it down. They said they sang it in song. And they realized exactly. They realized that to preserve the science, you put it into a, a song, and you preserve it that way. You pass it down through the bards. That's how people memorize these the stories, and they're it's just, there's a scientific layer behind the mythology. But the problem is, is when you get an antagonistic religious uh, uh, colon colonizer that's out yeah. to destroy. All you have to do is 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 kill those who hold the knowledge, right? right? This is why the Orphics tried to encode their mystery into the language without actually saying it. Right? They put it in parables and in metaphor. But it's it's ironic that the they the people after Plato were looking back at Hesiod and Homer. Oh, they don't know anything. They're just you know a bunch of uh, superstitious fairy tale tellers of of, of uh, um the, the, the myths. Well, you know uh, what do you call it? Fables. They're calling it. Oh, they're just fables. Then you realize later on there's there weren't just fables. There was something behind these stories. The real fables was the the dogmatic faith versus you have to have faith or else. That's one, thing that, one thing that blew my mind was when I recognized that the, the, the extent of the imagination, right? This is something that we've lost is the ability to memorize and imagine, okay? We have to understand like when you look at something like Homer, this was utilized as a memory palace. We have right. text on how to encode information. They're not just memorizing the song. The song is telling them their entire history of their people. It's encoding math. It's encoding Geography. everything. This is why we don't have this well-rounded basis that these people had, because we've lost these traditional methods of imagination and building these strong uh, connections in our minds. They're creating universes. They're building these ideas, right? Like, anyway. <laughs> I think it, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you're, you're good. Well, so I was going to say something about fumigation. We were talking about fumigation earlier and how aroma, when you, when you know how to control for aroma and you know your audience has a certain response that an aroma is going to give them, uh, if you're having a, 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 a mystery, right, you can use particular fumigants to uh to to give people nostalgia or to give them some sort of an association with that particular aroma right and we don't have that that's that's one of those things that you have to experience right it's not written down you don't have it doesn't say like oh well heat the stone to this particular temperature put this proper amount weighed out by this amount it's like well you know the room you kind of put this much smoke and you got to add this cuz you know these people are, they they want something to smell particularly perfumey for well whatever. there are some things right? like if you smell sulfur you know that the goddess is near <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but that was what I was saying. Is that yeah. there's um, aroma has one has this way of of triggering a memory or putting you in a particular state that language can't capture. It's I found an old bottle of cologne. To, you found an old bottle of cologne, and it reminded me of the. Uh, all of a sudden, all these ancient, all these old memories from high school start popping oh, in my brain again. Yeah, yeah, exactly, oh. exactly, exactly. Right. So you know that's not something that you can put into into writing. You can do your best to approximate it. Right. You, but if I if you were to like write down your most sincere way to capture how that perf that that cologne made you feel in that moment and took you back in the past, I wasn't in the past with you. Right. 
I don't know what that association with that smell did to you. How did, I didn't have that transformation into the past. So that immediately puts you into the realm of poetry and yeah. elaborate poetry, right? And I, 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 I would admit I was being a little facetious when I was talking about superiority. Obviously, the Greek language is superior to any other language. The Greek language has the ability to capture things in poetry yeah. that all other languages don't because have. Every syllable, every syllable has a deeper meaning and a, and a history behind it. Every syllable. Yeah. So, Neil, what, what I, uh, my, my school of philosophy, the Cerberusian School of Cynicism, has coined a term for what you experienced. And that experience is called nose gnosis and nose noose. Uh, so you, so you, you went on an olfactory uh, uh, odyssey, just yeah. because of a smell. And why do you think? Why do you think the priests of the Orphic mystery say when you do this hymn, you take you subscribe this type of uh, aromatic, whether it's be yeah. myrrh or frankincense or storax? They had a prescribed lighting of a certain incense for each hymn. Exactly what you're talking about. Yes, exactly. There's a reason for it, and it's because they were capturing and facilitating nose gnosis and nose noose, just like what you experienced. You experienced something that you know that you cannot actually put into language. You can only put into poetry. You cannot smell the thing in itself. You can only approximate it, right? And any attempt to describe smell is immediately poetry. And the Greek language has so many words available to it that love- they didn't come up with the word nose noose and nose gnosis. It's, it blows my mind. They also didn't have words for homosexuality. So, you know, they had their particular mindset. So, you know. <laughs> Which tells you something because you they can have a they had a word for everything. They had 10 words for everything. The fact that they don't have a word for that is like that was that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, but that shows you something. That shows Good. you something. You know, they had the they had the uh, fragrance, Mandy, for um uh gods individual gods and we know that for example we can reproduce the fragrance of aphrodite and if you do it's funky it's funky baby and it smells like oh god i hate to say it um because i can't do it without just really getting into it you know what i mean but um (laughs) it smelled like earth vagina earth vagina i had them reproduce this stuff for the for the performance of St. Mary's University. Yep. So when the audience comes in, they're already in a place of sex actively. They're already there, right? And their mind is open to that. They don't even realize it, right? Subconsciously. Um, one of the gods is described as um, smelling of a sweet, sick, decaying flesh. Right. Um, the, imagine. So it's not always like really good odors. It's just odors. Right. It's just powers. So, yeah, that's they were big on that, man. The smells. Can, I, can I show oh, you God. something about the limitations of the English language? You just did it. You just said the word imagine. You can't imagine a smell. A smell is a sight. Right. So the language say you can't you can you cannot. There, uh, what is the word for it? How do you put that? How do you in in, in inner smell this? It doesn't work. The language is clumsy. We sound like barbarians because we fucking are, right? <laughs> bravo, bravo. And no, but you're so right, Ammon, right? When I read these magical texts, right, they always encode all this stuff. And, like, there's always this debate. I remember reading um, these rites to Saturn, and they talk about this herb called the storax. But no one knows what storax is anymore. Apparently, that the modern storax isn't the old storax, oh, really? and it may have gone extinct. Right? Like, there's all these debates. Like, you can read hundreds of papers where these people are arguing, you know. But like, this stuff was so important to these people. It's like you need to have this, right? You can't just you can't just invoke deity. You need to have all of the accoutrement. You need to have everything they like, you know. <laughs> Aroma is one of those major components. But we should uh, wind the- um, down, guys. We're coming up to our – we're just past our hour mark here. So this was a lot of fun. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming out for our uh, spring equinox special. Make sure you go watch Neil's latest video where he dives deep into all of the stuff we've been talking about here. Um, Mandy just released a new book. Make sure you go pick it up. Do you have it there, Mandy? Oh, hell yeah. The Towel of Minerva, Volume 2. Uh, it's awesome. I actually have a poem that's in there in the Friends section, right? <laughs> yeah. Nice. 
Love it. And uh, also make sure you subscribe to Dr. Ammon at his channel, Lady Babylon 666. He does live streams every Friday. So thank you guys all for, for coming out for this. Neil, any last words for our audience on the spring equinox? Hilaria, day of washing. Just remember that it is the day of washing and we are talking about a spring equinox death, mourning, and resurrection festival that predates Christianity by over at least, I'll be, I'll be fair, a thousand years, probably more than that. We're talking Bronze Age, Phrygian, ancient stuff. Way before Christianity came on the scene, this stuff was already going down. And that's what we call Easter now, but we already had that. So, And we're doing it right. It's right now. So happy Hilaria. What about you, Mandy? Any last words for everyone here? Uh, yeah, I think in the spirit of uh, the washing day, um, you know, just one last time to invoke Diogenes, uh, you can't wash your lettuce in the same river twice. <laughs> Thank you, Mandy. And how about you, Emin? Any last words? That was a total nerd joke, Mandy. Um, I like it, though. I like it. Uh, yeah, um, to the... Christians entering the great season of Easter, realize that you're not who you think you are. Um, you really owe it to the great mother and um, have a happy egg hunt. Um, thank you for having. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much. Uh, peace, love, hail Satan. Take care, everyone. Okay.